Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Arshad Ali. I'm a postdoctoral fellow here at the um, Institute for Urban Minority Education, UMI. I think most faces are pretty familiar, but I know there are some new faces here. So just to begin, I'll tell you a little bit about the center and where we are and um, why we're here. So this is um, the Edmund Gordon, Camp Gordon Campus of Teachers College. Um, and in this center, this for urban minority education, the center's been here for about 40 years um, at the Teachers College campus. And I think one of the things um, um, we've been trying to do in this year under the new leadership of Dr. Morell, who's over on the side, if you haven't met um, Dr. Morell yet, is really kind of revitalize the center and breathe kind of a new life into it and a life um, that's really connected not just to the university, but to the space and the place we're in, particularly um, in Harlem on um, 125th and Adam Thick Tower where we sit. And I think where we sit also becomes a really important point to kind of think about physically. Um, because where we sit is what used to be the Teresa Hotel, now the Teresa Towers. And we talk about that a lot um, at UMI, that we talk when we meet, but it's also, I think, an important thing to remind ourselves about and also to the new people in this space because what this, what this space represents in its history, um, the hotel used to be a center for um, for, for both kind of um, black American political and cultural life as well as um, international dignitaries um, and people traveling particularly from the third world would stay here. And this is where Castro stayed when he visited the states in the 60s. This is where um, the second floor housed the um, organization of Afro-American Afro unity um, that was run by Malcolm X. Um, so this place is an important historical place and I think it's important that we're based here for those reasons. Um, and it's also, I think, really fortunate in that regard, and continuing um, part of that legacy, I think, is the talk we're, we're privileged and lucky to have um, by Catherine Vincent today, who is, I've had the pleasure to get to know over the past eight months or so, what, as Catherine's been a visiting scholar um, at Teachers College, and at UMI, I've had the chance to get to know her, talk to her about her work, and what she's done over um, the past decade in London, and thinking about some of the issues um, particularly in Harlem, and the way Harlem has been, not just a center for black American life, but, um, but black internationalism in the United States. Um, I think Catherine's work really helps us think about that, not just in the United States, but more broadly in her work. She's gonna be talking about lots of different issues, and Catherine comes to us, um, as I mentioned, from London. Um, she's been a tenure teacher, school administrator, teacher educator, um, working in um, some of what, what are deemed the most challenging parts of London um, with um, Bengali and South Asian youth. And her talk today is going to be, it's a really exciting talk. I think one of the things I'm excited to hear about from Catherine is she does this great job of connecting um, global macro issues, issues of a British empire with the lives of young Bengali women in East London and thinking about what, what, that, what those histories mean and look practice. I think we're gonna get a, we're gonna get a chance to really see some of that exciting work from Catherine is. I'll wrap it up and I'll let Catherine um, share her work with us over the next four minutes. So
couple of people in the room um, and not so much for others. So I'm going to talk a bit more about the context than, than I probably um, would usually. Um, but um, I also would, would really like it to be a colloquium. So I'm going to try and leave plenty of time at the end for questions and discussion because um, there are some really fantastic people in the room who I know um, will have some interesting things to say and I think some interesting responses to some of the things that I'm going to say. So um, I'm going to try not to talk for too long, you'll be relieved to hear. Um, so to start, I wanted to um, talk about the, um, the title of, um, of my talk. Um, this phrase called Between Two Cultures is taken from a report written in 1976 by the Community Relations Commission in the UK. Um, it was part of the UK government's response to tensions around race and immigration that surfaced in the 1960s which was a time of significant change in the UK, partly because of immigration from the former colonies, and in particular, um, the Indian subcontinent. Um, this particular report, entitled Between Two Cultures, looked at relationships between different generations within the British Asian community. And it argued that Asian children, and I should say that in the UK, when we, when we use the term Asian, we usually mean India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. Um, when we the report argued that Asian children who have been born or brought up in Britain are inev inevitably torn between the culture of their home, which their parents have brought with them from another place, and the culture of the school and the neighbourhood which they encounter on a daily basis. Um, although it seems quite outdated really, um, this is still quite a common way of thinking. The belief that children from immigrant families are bound to face difficulties in finding a secure sense of identity, and in reconciling what's happening in the home with what's happening in the school. Although I think cultural deficit models have been largely discredited in terms of explaining achievement gaps, it's still common in the UK for children from non-white families to be seen as inherently problematic or difficult. Schools often assume that ethnic minority students are potential underachievers who need extra help to assimilate and integrate to the school community. There's also, however, throughout educational discourse in the UK, a reluctance to recognise cultural differences in learning practices. And this is partly a result of government policy that has, for many years, promoted the idea of a common culture, rather than focusing on differences between groups. Um, this quote from um, Eve Gregory, um, which is actually about um, the teaching of reading, I think draws attention to this. Um, the reluctance within the UK to recognise that there are differences, and that it isn't just about um, what, what we have in common. So I think this draws attention to the way that, that this philosophy can lead to a deficit model. And I'm going to argue that there's a fundamental problem here, or several problems really. It's not only that this way of thinking tends to be negative and pathologizing, but it tends to see the home culture as inferior and problematic, that it perpetuates the process of othering, which is the foundation for occupation, colonization, and racism. And it ignores the extent to which the problem is located within the system and the structures, rather than within the students and their families. It's also that the persistence of this approach suggests that we fail to take into account the radical changes to some fundamental aspects of our world which have taken place in recent years. That we need to reevaluate the terms, the meanings of terms such as culture, identity, and community, in the light of ways in which our communities and our lives and the lives of the young people around us have changed and are continuing to change. That, in response, we as educators may need to fund fundamentally rethink some aspects of our practice from the content and structure of the curriculum to our instructional approach and the way we negotiate relationships with families and communities. I think one starting point would be to have an honest and open discussion with some kind of national dialogue about finding answers to these questions. I'm not sure about the US, but in the UK, I think um, that we haven't yet come to the point where we have a common understanding um, of, of where we stand in relation to this. How do we, in this 21st century world, come to explain ourselves, who we are and where we come from? What narratives of identity do we offer to our young people? How do we enable them to understand the relation of their stories and their family's stories to the world around them? This kind of dialogue is obviously not an easy process, particularly in a nation which has not yet really come to terms with its colonial past. This is perhaps partly why politicians so often choose to engage in rhetoric, like you can see um, Tony Blair doing, our former Prime Minister, rather than engaging with the real issues. I should say, however, that to give Prime Minister Blair credit, um, he is at least attempting to articulate a vision of what a modern British identity might be, in contrast with our current um, Education Secretary, 
who doesn't even seem to see as problematic his professed admiration for the statesman of Victorian Britain, whose quest to dominate and subjugate um, people all around the world led to the slaughter of uh, thousands and um, the suffering of hundreds of thousands more. He's going to be my big boss when I go back, so <laughs> <laughs> that's great. <laughs> um, so much for politicians. The research which I'm going to talk about today takes a different approach. Um, it attempts to explore these issues with the aim starting to reevaluate the meaning of culture and identity in the lives of young people and its impact on their educational experiences. In terms of my approach to the research process, it's important to say at this point that like the rest of the team here at UBE, as many of you know, I'm interested in exploring these issues not in an abstract or a purely theoretical way, but in relation to the real lives of young people, the next generation who will take over from us when our jobs are done. We're primarily concerned with the education of vulnerable and marginalised groups who might otherwise not have a voice, or whose voices might be ignored. When I talk about narratives and stories, um, I mean that I'm interested in stories in the sense that the poet Michael Rosen talks about here. Stories in the broad sense of storytelling. Storytelling is something which is a natural and a basic urge and part of what makes us human. I'm also talking, however, in a more specific or theoretical way about narrative research methods. Um, I wouldn't say I've achieved it yet, but I'm, achieving, I'm aspiring towards the style described here by Sarah Lawrence Lightfoot um, in her book on portraiture. <coughs> there are several aspects of, of her book, and I would really recommend this to anyone interested in qualitative, qualitative or narrative research, several aspects of her approach which I think are really important. Firstly, the desire she articulates to focus on a method that can capture the complexity of human experience. Also her desire to search for what is good and healthy, rather than focusing on pathology um, or simply documenting um, the negative aspects of what's happening um, in the social sciences. And thirdly, her desire to move beyond the academy by producing narratives that are interesting and informative and inspirational for readers outside of the narrow world which um, most of us here represent. She talks about working towards a people's scholarship, which might sound idealistic, but I think sometimes it's right to have ideals that we work towards. Of course, there are lots of challenges with this approach. Um, as articulated here, um, I think it can be common in narratives to try to find a sense of a happy ending. Um, and it's equally easy to go in the other direction. Um, and also, um, this is how Harold Rosen, who's one of the great educationists of the 20th century, the father of Michael Rosen, and he talks about middle class takeover, how when um, academics and researchers encountered the stories of young people and their families, um, there's this almost inevitable tendency to shape them um, in, in according to our own narratives. I wouldn't like to say um, that I've overcome these problems, um, but I'm always reassured by this quotation by Kay Hall, who, like me, is a white woman researching the experiences of Muslim girls in the UK. What she says here is really important to me because I think it serves as a limitation and also a liberation. I read back over this whenever I'm feeling demoralized about my research, partly to remind myself that it's okay for the stories I tell to be subjective, partial, and personal, because I've chosen an approach that doesn't claim to give access to any kind of objective truth. The real aspect of this statement for me though, is that I believe it could just as easily be applied to any kind of research, that in fact all we can ever do is to tell our own stories and to be as responsible as possible with the stories to which we have access. For me that is really just as true of a statistician producing graphs of students' test scores as it is of an anthropologist or ethnographer. The data to which we have access can only ever give us part of the picture, can only ever tell part of the truth. The difference is that some approaches accept and even embrace the subjectivity, as Professor Morell says so well in his forthcoming book. I hope you don't mind me quoting from this book. <laughs> <laughs> so the stories I'm going to tell are as much about my own experiences as they, are, as they are about my students. I'm a participant in this story, and my actions have shaped the events which I'm going to recount. My perspective on the events, um, on the issues I'm going to explore, is captured really beautifully here. And this is one of my favourite Those of you who came to the culture circle on um, pedagogy for the oppressed will remember our discussion about this. It resonates so powerfully with my experiences as a classroom teacher and school administrator. How many other educators sitting here 
would recognise the description of their everyday experiences as being full of tensions, contradictions, fears, doubts and deferred dreams. Are we coloniser or colonised? How can we as educators continue to work within the system once we recognise the extent to which it, it encodes and reproduces prejudice, privilege and inequality? So with these questions in mind, I'm going to tell some stories about the young people I've worked with over the last 10 years. Stories of culture, identity, community, and belonging, which I hope will start a conversation about ways in which we can move forward in terms of rehumanizing the education system. Um, most of you, I hope, know where England is. I'm not gonna like do it. <laughs> 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 Okay, just over the Atlantic Ocean. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, we're, we're quite famous around the world for lots of things we're tra now trying to um, forget and put behind us. Slavery, colonisation, something about taxation without representation. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't hold that against us. I think there are three of us in the room who are British, myself and Elaine, and Andy who is Scottish, I should say. <laughs> Yeah, have issues with me afterwards. <laughs> um, so, the colonial capital London um, <clears throat> looks like this. And you can see the two schools that I'm going to be talking about um, marked on the map. Um, this is the school where I've lived and worked for the last 10 years. A um, few facts just um, out of interest London's nearly 2,000 years old. It's the largest city in Europe and one of the most diverse. It's home to around 8 million people, so about half the size of New York and it's increasingly um, diverse. About 60% of Londoners describe themselves as white British. So that means 40% um, don't do so, and the foreign born population is around 30%. About 40% of secondary school students and 35% of primary school students describe themselves as white British. So you can see that the school population is increasingly diverse, and that gives some indication of the kind of issues that we need to consider within the education system. Although its population is only half the size, London's often compared with New York in terms of their common status as global cities, places of super diversity, where people speak different languages, eat different foods, wear different clothing, listen to, listen to different music, and subscribe to different sets of beliefs. New arrivals live and work alongside long established residents, and new ways of living emerge from interactions between disparate and previously unfamiliar groups. In this diverse, multicultural, urban context, issues of culture and identity pose particular challenges, partly due to the sense of placelessness that can accompany the experience of living in a global city. I'm going to talk about the first school now in a way which I hope will illustrate this. This is School A. Um, this is basically where the students live, who come to the school in these kind of tower blocks. Um, as I say, it's on the eastern edge of London. Most of the people who live there in this place originally lived in the centre of London. Um, they're the original um, poor white people living in the east end of London who moved out um, in the decades following the Second World War, and I'll talk more about that later. So it's an area of high poverty, unemployment, and deindustrialization. It was recently made famous by the movie Made in Dagenham. Anyone seen Made in Dagenham? Um, it was about the strike, the strike of women workers at the local Ford Motors plant. It was one of the biggest Ford Motors plants in the world. Um, for equal pay, which um, was one of the things that led to um, equal pay legislation being instituted nationally. The plant is now closed, however, and the area blighted by unemployment and a large range of social problems, although some efforts at regeneration have been made in recent years. I call this school in my research Oak Park as a pseudonym. And Oak Park is seen locally as a popular and successful school, as you can see from this glowing recommendation from school inspectors a few years ago. It achieves very high exam results compared to other local schools and schools with similar levels of socioeconomic deprivation. It wasn't an easy place to work, however, and when I was there it was clear to me the students were bringing into school many of the tensions present in the local community during what was an unsettling time both locally, nationally and internationally. When I started at the school in 2002, the world was very much still reading from the September 11th attacks and the British public were engaged in heated debate about the war in Iraq, which began in spring 2003. In contrast with the rhetoric here of the Department for Education, <coughs> Britain was in fact at this time becoming an increasingly segregated and separated society. Um, the Roundtree Foundation, um, which is a fantastic organisation researching poverty and inequality in the UK, highlighted this in a report published in 2005. 
which showed that children were increasingly being discouraged by their parents by their families in the communities from mixing with people from different cultures, from different communities, and from different religions. <coughs> Meanwhile, tabloid newspapers stoke people's fears of foreigners and immigrants. Far-right nationalist political parties, such as the British National Party, you can see here the BNP demonstrating against Islamic Britain, they exploited for political gain the anxiety and mistrust which lingered after the 2005 bombings of the London Transport Network. This party, which claims that British people are in danger of becoming extinct and advocates voluntary repatriation for immigrants and their descendants. They went on to win 12 seats in the 2006 local elections in the borough where this school is situated. Some of the students in my classes had parents who were actually standing for election for this party and certainly were members and voted for them. So this is the context in which I was working. Um, I was a novice teacher. Um, <laughs> trying to get used to being a teacher, let alone dealing with all of these issues. And I'm going to talk in particular about one aspect of, of my teaching during this time. Um, one of the things I was responsible <coughs> for teaching was this collection of poems. You can see the list here. Um, this is a collection entitled Poems from Different Cultures and Traditions. It's worth saying here that the UK, unlike the US, has a national system of exams. And all students in the country take the same exam age 16. And there's not much choice in the syllabus. So most of the students studied the same poems and these were a compulsory part of the syllabus so I had to teach them um, and the students had to study them whether they liked it or not. In fact they really didn't like it. Um, as you can see if anyone's familiar with any of the poems, um, they rather ambitiously attempt to cover several decades of history, all six world continents and a range of contentious issues including slavery, colonialism, apartheid, Scottish nation nationalism and the Ubiquistasy and the Vietnam War. <laughs> Given that in my school each poem was allocated 45 minutes of teaching time during the year, it's perhaps not surprising that the 15 and 16 year old students found it difficult to engage with the poems and almost impossible to understand the complex issues which they explored. They complained vociferously about having to study the poems. They found it possible to hate poems like this. And during the course of our lessons, they were openly hostile, at times making explicitly racist comments. It wasn't just the students either, while the racism was. The teachers weren't racist, but they did, um, they did hate teaching the poems. They said it was like pulling teeth, that there was just too much resistance, and the students' lack of engagement meant that this was the section on the, on the exam where all the students achieved the lowest marks. So even though the teachers really appreciated the opportunity to teach wonderful poems like this, it wasn't working. I was intrigued by this problem at the time because it wasn't one for which I was at all prepared. During my teacher training, we spent a great deal of time talking about the importance of teaching multicultural texts and in finding literature that would be relevant to students' lives. This mainly focused on the needs of students who were English language learners. There was never really any discussion of the needs of working class students. In fact, there was never much discussion of class at all, except perhaps a passing reference to the underachievement of white working class boys. So I wanted to find out more about this and to try to find some solutions. And so um, when I was studying for my master's degree, I chose to write my dissertation about my experiences of teaching these poems. I wasn't sure at first of the theoretical and methodological approach I wanted to follow, so I started reading people like Edward Said and Homi Bawa. And thinking more deeply about these issues of culture and identity, and doing some work with my students to explore what they thought. Um, the results were pretty depressing. The students had diverse ideas about the meaning of cultural identity and its relevance to their lives. For some of them, they really just wanted to talk about popular culture, while others explored aspects of contemporary events and politics, not always from a positive um, point of view. To explore the issues further, I surveyed students, parents, and their teachers, and I carried out a series of interviews and discussions with students where we talked about issues of culture, identity, community, belonging, and these related issues. Again, the results were pretty depressing. They reinforced <coughs> this stereotype notion of cultural deficit amongst the white working class, and they revealed a considerable degree of hostility amongst students and parents to the, the idea of culture, the concept of culture, and the idea of studying poems from different cultures. There was a widespread belief that the community were justified in being hostile to outsiders and immigrants. They seemed really to have taken on board 
the concept of white working class culture that Spencer articulates here, this idea of deficit. I'm just going to show you two short extracts from the evidence I collected at this school. The first is from student M. Obviously, that's not his real name. The response of student M to my questions about culture were typical of the views expressed by students in this class, in lessons, in general, and in the interviews and questionnaire. Almost all of the students were from white working class families. He articulates, actually, a lack of culture. This resonates with Kinchelow's analysis of the failure of the British approach to multiculturalism in the late 20th century. The feasts and festivals model has led to culture being, something of, being seen as something alien and foreign, which belongs to others and is perceived as being in opposition to the norm of Englishness. M is unwilling or unable to articulate what being English means. When pressed on this later in the interview, he talked about street culture and violence and said at one point that he, he thought his culture was going down the toilet. It's not then that he sees his own culture as superior, quite the opposite in fact. His perception of Englishness is an absence or a lack of culture, a space waiting to be filled by dysfunctional youth subcultures and right-wing political propaganda. The second extract I'm going to show you here is from the research journal which I kept during this time, and I think it illustrates the impact of this breakdown in cultural competence. This records an incident which happened when three lovely girls um, in the sixth form of my school um, came to report a racist incident in which um, a boy said to them, actually said to them, and thought it was okay to say to them, the BMB have won now, it's time for you to go. The girls were obviously devastated, as was I, and um, we dealt with it very seriously, but the fact that this is happening seems to me um, to be an indictment of really what's happening, not just in this, in this small community, but in our city and in our country as a whole. There's clearly a connection here. Those who see themselves as having no culture, who do not have confidence in their own sense of identity or a secure position in society, feel threatened by outsiders who appear capable of overtaking them in the struggle for scarce resources in which they believe themselves to be embroiled. This can be seen as a continuation of the divide and rule strategy used so extensively by the British government during the colonial era. As long as the white working class blame immigrants for their problems, they will continue to ignore the real culprit. As long as the oppressed are divided amongst themselves, they're a manageable population and therefore no threat to the dominant social order. It was difficult as a teacher to be conscious of these issues and frustrated by them on a daily basis, yet powerless to do much about them. Within my classes, I continued to find ways to engage students in discussion about culture, identity, and these other issues. But it became increasingly difficult, given the hostility of students, parents, their families, and to some extent, <coughs> school administrators. Um, for various reasons, not just connected to my research, I then decided to move in 2006 to school B, the second school I'm going to talk about. So I worked at this school for five years between 2006 and 2011, first as an English teacher and then as um, assistant principal. Um, I'm going to talk just a little bit about the context of this school because it's a really unique place and a fascinating place. I know at least one person in the room has spent some time there, I think. Um, and. I hope that talking about the place will help to give a sense of context to the work I was doing there. Um, so as you can see, um, it's a place again of poverty and many social problems. It's geographically very close to the centre of London and to the two main financial centres. It's very much cut off from them and oasis of poverty in the midst of the wealth of the city. Um, it's located, as this old map shows, um, within the heart of what's known as the East End of London. If any of you have watched EastEnders, mm. this is basically the area. You can see the river. Um, it's a map of EastEnders, which I'm going to show you now. Um, so, this area is close to the docks, and it's an area in which um, recent immigrants have always come to live when they first arrived in London. In the 17th century, Huguenot silk weavers arrived from France. In the 19th century, Irish and Jewish immigrants from Eastern Europe and Russian and German radicals avoiding arrest, including Trotsky, Lenin, and Stalin. This is what the area was like at that time. Um, it wasn't a very nice place to live. And you can see here a description from an American perspective. Jack London wrote this while living in the East End for several months, sometimes staying in workhouses or sleeping on the streets. The conditions he experienced and wrote about were the same, as, the same as those experienced by an estimated half a million of the London poor. That's half a million people living in these conditions. And these are the direct ancestors of the students who were at the school I previously was talking about. 
This kind of writing, similar to that done by Jacob Rees in New York, can be seen as an early form of narrative research. Through participant observation, he gathered sufficient data, both quantitative and qualitative, to create an accurate and compelling story about the real lives of these people living on the margins of society. The growing awareness of the huge social problems in this part of London led to slum clearances in the early 1900s, and this is when the families started to move out. And this continued during the next half century as the area was heavily bombed during both World Wars, again because of its close proximity to the docks. Then, after the Second World War, immigrants from former colonial nations started to arrive, including um, men from the province which was at the time known as the Pakistani province of East Bengal and is now known as Bangladesh, the grandparents and great-grandparents of the students at the school I'm going to talk about. Um, some of you will be familiar with these maps, I'm sure. Um, this shows how Bangladesh was part of um, colonial India, so during the British occupation of India, this pink and yellow area is all um, under British rule. Bangladesh is here, and um, this is the map showing the modern um, Bangladesh. The I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Um, so, most of the immigrants who came to Britain during this time, and almost all of those now living in this area of London, came from the region of Silet, which is marked on the map up there, which is in the northeast um, corner of the country. In fact, Silettes started coming to Britain in the 18th century, when they were employed as Laskers by the British East India Company. During the Second World War, large numbers of them were recruited by the British Navy. They were serving on the British ships, but conditions on the ships were so bad that they escaped. And again, that explains the concentration near to the docks. That's where many of these men jumped ship. Um, as you can see here, significant Bangladeshi population is not recorded in the UK census until the 1960s, when the male population became more settled. And it increased significantly and very quickly in the following years as wives and children were brought from home. This was legal immigration, because at the time, migrants from former colonists were encouraged to move to Britain, partly because of labour shortages after the Second World War. Um, Select, um, it's interesting to note, is now one of the wealthiest areas in Bangladesh, largely due to remittances um, from emigrants, which amount to um, $5 billion every year. So these are the young women um, whose stories I want to focus on for the final section of the talk. Um, they're descendants of the men who came from Bangladesh, and who, for the most part, have remained in London throughout their lives. They live in a small, densely populated area, which, as mentioned before, has high levels of social and economic deprivation. Child poverty, overcrowding, unemployment and worklessness are common. The Bangladeshi community have the worst health of any ethnic group nationally, the lowest participation in higher education, and the highest level of dependence on welfare support. Of course, these indicators of deprivation do not account for the complex economical, economic, political and social context of students' lives or their cultural heterogeneity. I think they do give an indication, though, of the challenges these students and their families face in achieving educational success, given what we know about the impact of poverty on school achievement. So I'm going to focus for the rest of the talk on the stories of these young people. Before doing so, I think it's really important to say that their stories are also part of other stories, some of which started before they were born, and others of which are only just starting to be told. Stories of nation struggles against colonization, of women's struggles against male oppression, Stories of working people's struggles against exploitation and of non-white people's struggles against racism and discrimination. Stories of a new era of global cities, transnational identities and digital technologies. And of course my own research is also part of a larger story. Um, this really crude diagram doesn't at all do justice to the influences on my research of various literature and theories. I don't expect you to even try to read it. Um, but it does give me a chance to mention again Saeed and Baba alongside Fanon, Spivak and Benjamin as well as Claire Bourdieu and Bauman, amongst others. I've also been influenced by feminist researchers such as Heidi Mirza, Pia Pickler, and Louise Archer, who've written extensively about the experiences of black and Asian women in the UK. More recently, as Joanne knows, as a result of attending Professor Narayan's um, excellent class on oppositional practice, practice last semester, um, I've come to know the work of US third world feminists like Mohanty, Angaldua, and Sandoval, who challenge us to move beyond the binaries of oppressed and oppressive to create new kinds of oppositional consciousness that can form the basis for real social change. Um, in, in terms of previous research into the education of British, Asian, and Muslim girls, um, it falls into three distinct phases, and it te has tended to focus on um, the failure of the British education system to meet the needs of immigrant students in general, and young Asian Muslim women in particular. Seeing Bangladeshi girls in British schools as victims of the prejudice, inflexibility, and racism embedded within the structures of the system. 
Um, as Pickler argues, however, this has been challenged by feminist researchers who draw attention to the impact on women in particular at the intersection of different kinds of discrimination. But what Mahanti refers to as the interwoven processes of sexism, racism, misogyny, and heterosexism. Some interesting research in this area has been done recently by researchers like Bazana Shane and I know you don't have time to read it, that's fine. And Yasmin Hussain, who traced the development of um, hybrid identities in the second generation in particular. These researchers focus on the agency of young women in negotiating their own identities and coming to a sense of who they are and where they stand in the world. I think it's right for them to sound a of caution as Muslim does here. I think it's right to question the assumption that transnational, transcultural individuals are inevitably imbued with special qualities. If we're not careful, this can become another version of Orientalism, simply another way in which we, in which we exoticize the other. And I hope that I managed to avoid that in the telling of stories about these young women. I think the students at the school inhabit a really interesting space in relation to the question of culture and identity. Partly because although nationally they're part of an ethnic minority group, and that's the term which is still used unproblematically in the UK a lot of the time, um, within their school and within their community, they're actually part of a majority group. And they have a lot of confidence around their culture and identity in that context. They also have a face a large number of challenges not just in relation to material poverty, but also the negotiation of culture, identity, and ethnicity, gender discrimination, and the potential for intergenerational conflict. So, in my research, I wanted to um, centralize the voices and perspectives of these young women. In particular, I wanted to challenge the simplistic and one-sided images that, as you can see here, tend to dominate the perception of Bangladeshi Muslim girls amongst the British public. They're so often seen as silent, passive victims of cultural or patriarchal oppression, whose families are complicit in their repression. I should say that it's not that these stories are wholly inaccurate. In fact, some of them are undoubtedly truthful and based on the reality of students' lives. I can tell you plenty of terrible stories about students' experiences of forced marriage, of domestic violence, and of abuse. But I'm choosing not to tell those stories for several reasons. Firstly, because they're stories of such sensitivity that I don't think it would be ethical for me to tell them. They're not really my stories to tell. Secondly, because those stories don't tell us anything new. They simply reinforce our awareness of the suffering inflicted by some people upon some other people. And they also may serve to reinforce negative stereotypes. So, I'm choosing to focus on stories of success, or at least of relative success, of young women who've overcome obstacles and to some extent succeeded within the system. I'm going to start by talking about the success of Bangladeshi girls nationally. Um, I know this is quite difficult to see, but what it basically shows is that Bangladeshi girls, who used to be the lowest achieving group in the UK, now achieve better at 79.9%. So this is the kind of number of students achieving the benchmark for success in UK schools. They achieve better than the average for all pupils and, bet and better than the average for white pupils. So it would seem a large amount of progress has been made. But Bangladeshi women continue to receive poor A-level grades to have the lowest higher education participation of any group nationally and to gain fewer first or upper class, second class degrees when they go to university. They have particularly low levels of labour market participation and high levels of unemployment, and they're less likely to earn well or be promoted when they, when they do find work. I want to talk about um, one group of students in my school who have some really interesting things to say about this. These are a group of students who are really succeeding against the odds. They're involved in um, the school's Star Academy program. This is a program of intensive support for students identified as being at risk of underachievement or of dropping out of school. The school allocates a significant amount of extra resources to this program, which includes individual and group mentoring, out of school activities, and a range of personalized provision. Um, some of the staff really perceive this program quite negatively, either thinking that it's a reward for failure or that it's potentially stigmatizing. But my discussions with students gave a much more positive perspective on the programme, as you can see from the students. Um, I'm not using their real names, of course. Um, I really like what Shamima says about how she used to think that she would be just a normal housewife, um, but has now started to think more creatively about her future. Um, and Sadia is one of the students who previously had a really bad reputation at school. Um, I had to um, suspend her from school on a number of occasions. She used to get into fights all the time, or just go and hang around in the shops and not bother coming to school. Um, but she talks about how the programme has helped her envisage a different and a more positive future. 
She doesn't excuse her previous behaviour, but she explains how she's now able to see beyond her problems. She's starting to see herself as being potentially successful in school. And um, she also talks about some of the things that did used to make it difficult for her. Um, in particular, she talks about exam pressure and how hard she finds it to sit still and be quiet. Which I don't think is particularly unwelcome. One of the things I found most surprising when talking to the students was their level of motivation and the way in which this had apparently increased as a result of taking part in the programme. Tamina and Selim were particularly animated when talking about how they wanted to repay the trust and belief shown in them by the principal of the school and by their head of year. Their response to the school's desire to give them a second chance is a commitment to prove that they are capable and that they can achieve. Um, when, I said, when I asked them what their favourite part of the programme was, this is what they said. I suppose this shouldn't have been surprising. After all, as human beings, we all know that we flourish when people show that they believe in us and support us and when we feel like we're part of something. But it has become common in policy discourse to position some young people as inherently problematic, demotivated or disaffected, rather than seeing them as full of potential. This is particularly true of young people from poor and non-white families, even though such thinking runs contrary to substantial research evidence, some of which you can see here, that there's no significant difference in motivation or in aspiration between young people from different communities. Although, you can see here that Working class young people are more likely to describe their school experiences as being problematic or unsatisfactory. In addition, there's increasing evidence to controvert the stereotypes that still pervade perceptions of young Bangladeshi women and their families. For example, this report, which is from the government's Business and the Community um, Commission, they found that Bangladeshi girls don't see their families as trying to force them into marriage or into leaving school and that actually they um, aspire to be professional, to work, and to have careers just like any other students. These findings resonate with my experiences of students and their parents, um, as well as the rest of my research. Um, a good example of this is Hamara. Um, one of the students who's now at university, whose progress at university I'm tracing during this year. Um, she joined the school in grade 12 after her parents chose to send her for the previous five years to a small local Islamic private school. These schools are often seen as conservative and reactionary institutions, which uh, really are seen as perpetuating um, outdated cultural and religious beliefs. Hamara mm -hmm. <coughs> believes that she experienced, she had some positive impact from being in this context. Um, she describes many of the teachers as being almost feminist and says that they always encourage the girls to take up every opportunity on offer. And as you can see here, she's dismissive of the minority of teachers who promoted a less progressive view. She doesn't believe at all that she has been held back by her family's cultural or religious beliefs. She strongly believes that her parents have always been supportive and have encouraged her to pursue her education and to follow her own interests. In fact, the only time her Myra has experienced any real discouragement was during her interview at Oxford University, one of our premier elite institutions. She actually loved the academic side of the interview and enjoyed her discussions with the tutors, but had one unfortunate encounter with another student, a young white man who had been recruited to help out on the interview day. Um, and she recounts this here, where he asked her where she was from. And when she told him, um, and the minute you say East London, that basically means the poor side of town, um, his response was, oh right, oh dear. Um, I was so proud of Hamira when she described when she described to me her reaction to him. She wasn't um, disconcerted for a moment, and she literally subverted the dominant order by getting this young man to carry her bags, which she said were full of Shakespeare, so would be really heavy. But <laughs> <laughs> I like taught her something. Um, Hamira's story is really interesting in the light of current debate in the UK about the practices of our elite universities. Um, you can see the problem in this graph, where students from private schools, which are shown here in red, make up 7% of students nationally, and 36% of students achieving A grades, and 45% of students at our two uh, most pres prestigious and most selective institutions. Kamara was initially rejected by Oxford, despite achieving the highest possible grades in all of her exams, and being one of the most, most well-qualified candidates I've ever encountered. She then reapplied the next year to Cambridge, where she was offered a place. Explanations about the underrepresentation of students from poor and non-white backgrounds in elite universities 
often focus on differences in achievement, low aspirations of students and their families, or a lack of support from schools. In Hamira's case, none of these are, are sufficient to explain her experience. She had plenty of support, I can testify to that. There was clearly something else going on here which needs further ex investigation. Um, the next student I want to talk about is um, Latifa. Like Hamira, she achieved really well in her final exams and is now in her first year at university. Um, she was in my English class um, about five years ago, lower down the school. Um, she was quite crazy. She was never really very focused um, and not very motivated, relatively capable, but never really keen on doing any work. And then she underwent this kind of miraculous transformation. I remember at the time thinking, what's happened? How has she changed? And as you can see here, she explains that the turning point in her education was a trip to Bangladesh to visit her sick grandfather. Contrary to conventional perceptions of the negative influence of home culture on young women's lives, it was in fact a conversation with family members back in Bangladesh that made her realize the importance of staying on in school and being committed to her studies. Latifa also talked extensively about the influence of her mother. Um, her mother, 15 years previously, had come over from Bangladesh with her two young children um, to discover that her husband, who was already living in the UK, had another wife and family here. She promptly left him and raised her two daughters by herself and has raised them to see education as the most important thing, to value it above all else. She is wholeheartedly supportive of her daughter's decision to stay on at university and has even allowed her to move away from home, which is very unusual. And of course, her own experiences in themselves and the decisions she's made in her life subvert perceptions of Bangladeshi women as passive victims of male oppression. Um, Latif is one of the girls that I'm following this year as, as she goes to university. And um, she was so excited um, about going. And when I, when I talked to her in the summer about what she thought it would be like, I remember feeling um, a real sense of anxiety for her because she was just so looking forward to it. She thought it was going to be the most amazing thing that had ever happened to her and everything was going to be brilliant. And I remember thinking, I, I, you know, I, I hope that's true. Um, when I asked her quite specifically, because I thought it was important to get her to consider it, I asked her whether she thought that she'd face any additional challenges or pressures because of being a young Muslim Bangladeshi woman living away from home where she probably wouldn't meet any other girls from her community doing so. She had this kind of attitude where she knew she might face some um, issues but she thought it would probably all be okay. She thought she was ready for it. Um, unfortunately, um, her experience when she got there um, was really problematic. I'm not sure if you can see this too well, but she says that she found the experience of going to university really difficult. She said to me um, at Christmas, when I um, met her to re-interview her, that she very, very nearly dropped out. Um, it wasn't that she found the academic side of her experience problematic. She said that she had no social life. She couldn't make friends with the other people on her course, partly because of the emphasis on drinking and partying which pervaded the first few weeks of term. She felt that the majority of students were there to have fun rather than to study, which obviously is unimaginable. Um, and <laughs> she couldn't quite understand why they were choosing to spend so much money on their education and then choosing not to attend lectures or to sit at the back so they could sneak in late and no one would see them. It's clear to me, based on my conversations with other students, that her experiences are not unusual. She told me of quite a number of girls she knows who've already dropped out or are thinking of doing so. Her um, proposed solution, I thought, was fascinating. Um, she told me that she wants the school, the school where I was working, that's to tell me that it's the end of the time, but I'm going to really quickly finish. Um, she told me that she wants the school to set up its own university so that the girls can stay there and finish college in the same place with the same teachers so that they don't have to leave. She's even been in to see the head teacher to, to suggest this. She's really serious about it. She thinks this is the solution. Um, obviously, that's not something which is likely to happen or would necessarily be beneficial. But I think it speaks to the experiences she's had in this school in this particular place. She wants to continue to be cocooned in the comfort zone which has been created for her. This resonates with um, the other data which I collected at the school. Um, I was aware that as I was a member of staff, and, and for most of the time there were senior members of, member of staff, the students weren't likely to give me um, negative perceptions of the teacher. They weren't likely to say to me, we don't think you meet our needs properly because you know, they would be personally criticizing me. So um, I got them to fill in an online questionnaire. And the students were overwhelmingly positive um, 
about their teachers. Um, they talked about the teachers being supportive, encouraging, and helpful. In fact, they did say at times that they thought the teachers were too helpful, and that one of the reasons they sometimes struggle when they go to university is because they're not prepared for the transition, because they're not used to working independently. This was also a point of view expressed by Marion. This is the final student I'm going to talk about today, so um, we're nearly done. Um, Marion is actually um, a student who left the school um, several years ago. She was one of the first students I taught at this school, and in some ways she epitomises the school's success and the success of her generation of young women from this community. She graduated with a degree in English from London University, and she's now um, training as an English teacher. I like to think that I had something to do with that. Um, she, however, um, we, ex we were exchanging emails um, several days ago, and she started talking to me about what it's been like for her on her postgraduate teacher training course. And it really broke my heart to know that she'd um, overcome so much, and that now she was on this course, she was having such a terrible time. Um, again, like the other students, she talked about the academic experience being really positive and about her tutors being supportive and encouraging to her. However, um, in terms of the other students, um, she has just experienced problems of not feeling like she fits in or like she can make friends or that she's within a group who support her. She talks about feelings of loneliness and isolation and a sense of alienation which is particularly palpable when she says here that she won't even go to... Actually, think on the next. She says here at the bottom that she won't even go to her own graduation because it, she hates it there so much. She's had such a negative experience. <coughs> Having known Marion for nearly six years, I know that this is not like her. Um, as she says here in the middle, it's really not like her. She's a gregarious and positive, intelligent and open-minded young woman. And I can't help feeling incredibly sad that she's such a, had such a negative experience of graduate school. It seems to me that it's an indictment of our education system and it's always an indictment of British society these young women, women are encountering these kind of issues in places where they should be safe. Hearing about her experiences reminded me of an article I read recently about doctoral education in the US entitled Am I Going Crazy? Which uses, have you read it? I think you said that to me actually. <laughs> um, it uses critical race theory to examine the experiences of young black and Hispanic students in doctoral programs identifying racial aggressions and socialisation practices and tracking their dehumanising impact on the graduate students. The author's conclusions are that we need to engage in a process of reimagining and rehumanising doctoral education, and I think this could just as easily be applied to the rest of the education system. So, finally, I'm going to return to problematise the quotation um, with which I started. It's clearly not sufficient to describe these young women as being caught between two cultures. That phrase is far too simplistic too deterministic, too disempowering. The complexity of their positioning within the structures of British society can, I think, be shown, um, that's just a quote, can be shown by my attempt to map their location in relation to mainstream British culture. It's possible, as you can see here, to, to identify many features of their identities that apparently place them in a marginal or liminal position, outside of the norm. However, this breaks down when we attempt to reverse the analysis and place the students at Hazel Grove, this school, in the centre. It's by placing them on the inside that the artifice of the whole structure and really the fragility of the notion of British culture becomes self-evident. And to finish up, I want to just return to Paolo Freire, who reminds us, of course, that these young women and their families have never really been on the outside but were always an integral part of the whole. We can't understand British society without understanding its colonial past. We can't understand our future without considering the realities of these young women's lives. Not because we feel a charitable or a philanthropic urge to help those less fortunate than ourselves, but because we acknowledge that actually there is no us or them, that our present past and future are and always have been intertwined in the most intimate way. I'm going to stop there and feel free to ask 